Okay, welcome again. Uh, this is the Research Roundtable webinar, The Energy, Transportation, and Habitat Nexus. My name is Iris Caldwell. I'm at the University of Illinois Chicago, and I'm excited to welcome you today to a webinar series that we are kicking back up again um, after a pretty successful series last year. Um, and are excited to uh, kick off with a topic that um, was actually suggested um, during last year's uh, webinar series, a focus on rare plants and the biodiversity value of rights of way. Um, and as we've been thinking about this topic and looking at the range of research that's being done, um, it was really difficult to narrow down. Um, you know, the, it's a broad topic and there's a lot of different angles uh, to, to take uh, this topic, but we're excited to have a number of presenters here to um, provide some insight into work that they're doing, looking at rare plants and or the biodiversity value of rights of way. Um, and look forward to some interesting discussion with you all um, on this topic as well as part of the, the roundtable today. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, Tega Obeyer, to uh, introduce the webinar today. Hello everyone, thank you again for joining us today. I'm sorry, Tega, I think you got muted, there you go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> with the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group here at the University of Illinois Chicago. Our objective with this webinar is to, one, highlight the current research in the topic of rare plants and the biodiversity value of rows, and really help facilitate some engaging conversations around the related research or research that can help us to understand the opportunities and benefits that highlight the importance of rare plants and the inherent biodiversity value of rights of ways. We will use this research roundtable to identify not only the existing and current research, but future research needs, and we hope to provide the opportunity for some collaborative work. So our hosts today are Ashley Bennett from the Electric Power Research Institute and Toby Chu from Southern Company. I'd also like to acknowledge Iris Caldwell and Karen Hernandez from the University of Illinois Chicago team. So just some few housekeeping items. Please keep yourself muted and your video off except during the breakout session. We encourage you to turn on your video during the breakout discussion session. If you will, could you please update your Zoom name to include your organization as well? You can do this by clicking on the three dots in the windows where your name is currently showing. If you're having any technical issues, please reach out to me through the chat. For any questions or comments that you might have for our speakers today, please drop them into the chat box after the conclusion of their presentations. They will do their very best to respond to your thoughts in the chat so we don't disrupt the next presentation and we stay in schedule. We are recording today's session and we will share it afterwards. So for today's agenda, in the first half, we will have three research presentations and the second half, we will have that reserve for breakout discussions, which will split us up into different rooms. We have some great questions we look forward to discussing. We will talk about the results of the discussion in a large group recap at the end. And now I will pass it on to our co-host, Toby, who will introduce our speakers for today. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So we're glad to have um, these three great presenters. Uh, first, Dr. Jared Daniels uh, from the McGuire Center for Lead, Lead Adoptory and Biodiversity Florida Museum of Natural History. He's going to be speaking about the value of right of ways for at risk, at risk species, excuse me, at risk species, uh, specifically monarchs and blue bees. Then we're going to have uh, Jonathan Soper from the land man, he's a land, land management specialist at Glacier, Glacier Creek Preserve and works at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. He's going to speak about plant community composition and floristic quality of revegetated roadsides in Nebraska. And last but not least, we're going to have Theo Wetzel of the Southeastern Grassland Initiatives talking about plant and pollinator biodiversity under the Tennessee Valley Authority's power lines on the Cumberland Plateau. So thank you very much for these speakers. And um, yes, please, Dr. Well, welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Iris and everybody for having me here today. Um, I'm going to talk, as as, um, as Toby mentioned, about uh, two at-risk species, namely the monarch and the blue calamantha bee. And these are both examples from uh, the state of Florida. Uh, 
sorry, to uh, to to start. Um, we we all know that the the North American migratory monarch was recently added uh, to the IUCN red list as an endangered taxon because of the recent declines uh, within North America. The eastern population has declined over eighty four percent, and in the west almost ninety nine percent. And the graph in the lower right hand portion of this slide shows uh, data from the state of Florida. Uh, which uh, looks over about three decades from 1994 until uh, 2018 and shows a very severe decline of about 84%. And this is the re-migration back from the mountains of Mexico, recolonizing portions of the deep south each year. So it mirrors the data from the overwintering colonies showing that monarchs are indeed uh, dwindling in the state of Florida uh, as they begin to recolonize much of the eastern seaboard. And to understand sort of the importance of how roadways um, and other easements uh, could potentially benefit uh, the return migration of the monarch, we were funded by a grant from the Florida Department of Transportation to better understand uh, the overall importance of Florida roadways for um, really providing habitat for this very key species of milkweed. This is pine woods milkweed, Asclepius humastrata. And this is an early spring species in the deep south. It's a sandhill and pineland species. And it's vegetative right at the time that monarchs are recolonizing, moving out of the mountains of Mexico and recolonizing the Gulf Coast uh, and Florida each spring. So it's a very important milkweed for the ultimate um, recolonization of the eastern seaboard. And across Florida, Sandhill and Pineland habitat have dwindled considerably due to urbanization, conversion to agriculture, and often um, kind of the remission of prescribed fire. And so roadways potentially have the ability to be really important for the long-term conservation of this plant. And so we undertook a study uh, surveying all FDOT managed roadways across North Central Florida from roughly Ocala to Jacksonville and West to Tallahassee. And in this map, uh, the areas of the roadways highlighted in blue have populations, viable populations of pine woods milkweed. And the roadways highlighted in red or the sections of roadways highlighted in red have ultra high densities of this plant. So from DOT's perspective in Florida, these would be priority areas in which to potentially adjust their vegetation management to uh, more essentially conserve this species and its available use to the monarch. Uh, and as you can see in the pictures on the right-hand side, these are, are pretty robust populations and they also really do harbor good populations of the monarch each spring in the state of Florida. We also know, of course, that um, mowing is uh, the most common, sorry, uh, it's a little jumpy on the advancement here, uh, the slides, that mowing is the most frequent use of uh, any type of vegetation management in Florida. And sorry, I, this is really jumpy with the advancement here. Um, and you can also see on the right-hand side of this slide that um, most of the pine woods milkweed tend to occur on the back slope of the road verge. So this is a perfect area in which for management to take place or reduce mowing overall. And we also know that mowing across Florida varies considerably from district to district and roadways in Florida harbor very, very good diversity of floral resources, uh, many rare plants, uh, many flowering forbs and grasses that are beneficial to a wide range of wildlife, uh, particularly pollinators and that these attract a wide variety of insect flower visitors. Uh, we also know from research that we've done in collaboration with the Department of Transportation uh, that simple changes in mowing frequency uh, make a big difference in uh, the availability of blooming resources. So in this context, we um, evaluated no mow every six weeks mowing and every three weeks, which was the norm in Alachua County, Florida. And what we found is that uh, going from three weeks to six weeks was statistically significant uh, and was essentially the same as going from three weeks to a no-mow regime. 
So this validates the fact that slight changes in mowing frequency can have really impactful results to the floral resources available and also to the flower visiting insects that are attracted. Um, and of course, we also want to have a better understanding of how these populations of milkweeds are doing long term. And it's very costly and time consuming to have boots on the ground to survey these because we'd ultimately like to know are these populations increasing, decreasing, or remaining stable over time. So we partnered with the University of Florida and Duke University, and this is Justin Ridge from Duke University, to evaluate the use of drones for monitoring these populations along roadways. And essentially trying to uh, develop a, a deep learning framework uh, and workflow where we could use drones, feed in data to uh, uh, machine learning uh, to help validate whether drones could effectively pick up these plants at different uh, stages of development over time uh, and ultimately be a much more effect effective and efficient and cost effective way of monitoring these populations long term. So in this context, we essentially um, go out in the field and we GPS uh, the plants to uh, use for training. And in this context, we're trying to evaluate what stage of phenology the plants are most effective for the drones to pick up. So you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, the plants are just emerging from the soil. So we are really trying to identify and evaluate different age classes of the plants along roadways for picking up. And then we also evaluate the different altitudes of flight of the drone. So as they fly over, they take image data, those get stitched together to form a complete uh, aerial image of the road verge. And then in this slide, you can see the different color codes uh, equate to different age classes, blue being emergent plants, green being those that are beginning to bud, and yellow being those that are already providing seed or are in full flower. So we can evaluate at which age class we're most effective at picking up this plant along roadways. And then we also are looking at, at what altitude do we fly the drones uh, across these landscapes. So we evaluated four different elevations from 10 meters to 25 meters. And you can see the resolution in these images. And obviously the clarity is better at lower altitudes, but still quite reliable even at 25 meters uh, in altitude. So we have really high hopes that this will um, ultimately be able to render high quality data that can monitor these populations long term. In addition, we, we also know that DOTs don't have drones uh, or they would have to be contracted. So we also are looking at using vehicle mounted cameras to evaluate the same context. So these are three different speeds, 35 miles per hour, 50 miles per hour, and 60 miles per hour. And here you can see the individual plants or milkweed plants that are showing up on these images. So these are fairly high resolution and can give quite good clarity also to evaluating for machine learning. So and this proof of concept, we're looking at both drones and vehicle mounted cameras to give some clarity for monitoring these populations long term. Again, to see if they're remaining stable, increase, increasing or decreasing, depending on what Florida Department of Transportation mowing regimes actually are in these areas. And then moving on to a, a separate project involving another pollinating organism. This is the blue Calamintha bee. This is a species endemic to Florida and scrub habitat. It's the species being evaluated by the US Fish and Wildlife Service for listing as endangered under the ESA. And it's a highly specialized bee. Historically was only known from four locations in central Florida. It's a floral specialist and feeds only on ashes calamint, which is the image pictured in the center portion of this slide, which is also a state endangered plant. So a state endangered plant uh, uh, being utilized by an ultra rare bee shows the value of sort of this pollinator network within the scrub habitat. And if you look at historically where this bee was found, it was only found at the southern portion of the map on the left hand side of this slide. Through our work over the last two years, we have found new populations of this bee uh, extending the range several hundred miles up north to Ocala National Forest. And Ocala National Forest is a very large conservation land in Florida. And the image on the right-hand side of this slide 
shows a Duke Energy utility easement. And this is high quality habitat for both Ashes calamit and also the blue calamit, the bee. This has floral resources in abundance, uh, hundreds and hundreds of plants of Ashes calamit, and also a oh, very open understory with lots of exposed sand uh, that can really tell you uh, that this is also really good nesting habitat for the bee. Uh, and if you look at similar habitat on the left-hand side of this slide versus the right-hand side, which is the utility easement, on the left-hand side, Ocala National Forest uses roller chopping instead of prescribed fire for their vegetation management. And you can see the very quick encroachment by oaks and sand pine and the more open understory on the right-hand side using herbicide and other ve vegetative management uh, techniques. So in the context for the bee, the rights away offer really high quality habitat that is disappearing in other areas that are managed within Ocala National Forest. So these also as, long linear, uh, also as long linear strips, they really help connect populations um, or colonies of this bee within Ocala National Forest, helping maintain a, a very real metapopulation structure. And again, in this slide, you can see the open understory, the exposed sand, very really good nesting uh, habitat, lots and lots of ashes calamit. And then in the inset on the lower right-hand side, you see ashes calamit adjacent to pine woods milkweed, which is also in abundance on these rights away because of the vegetation management. So this is a good example of a right away that serves not only a rare plant, a rare bee, but can also be really viable habitat for the North American migratory monarch. So really three rare taxa being well utilized or well served by this Duke Energy right away. And moving forward with this project, we want to continue to evaluate uh, the benefit of these rights away and especially as these rights away grow. And here you see a number of hazard trees that are sand pines that are approaching or in many cases uh, going above the wires on this rights away as utility companies come in and manage the vegetation. How is the habitat for the bee and the bee overall going to be responding to this type of vegetation management? So this is a long-term project where we hope to glean a lot of very valuable information to ensure that we manage this population of blue calamit, the bee, and the ashes calamit, the plant upon which it relies long-term within a, uh, a national forest within Florida. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. I want to acknowledge funders and collaborators, uh, Duke University for their work with us with drones, and of course, uh, many folks in my lab, particularly Chase Kimmel, who's my conservation uh, biologist and has been instrumental in helping us with kind of the boots on the ground efforts for both of these projects. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very fascinating. And I'm sure uh, people will have some questions in the chat you can answer. Um, we're going to continue with Jonathan Soper talking about plant community compositions and re and revegetated roadsides in Nebraska. All right. I think I've got control of the presentation, so I'll get started. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, John Soper. I'm with the University of Nebraska here in Omaha. I'm currently a land management specialist at uh, Glacier Creek Preserve, which is a teaching and research center on the edge of Omaha. Uh, prior, I was with the Nebraska DOT doing threatened and endangered species consultation. So, and then prior to that, I was with the University of Lincoln. So I've kind of seen both sides of the right of way work um, being in as a researcher and also working for the Nebraska DOT. So it, it, I've got you know, kind of a, a range of experience, but what we want to, I'm going to talk about today is a project we did when I was back at the University in Lincoln, um, and it is plant community composition and forest equality on revegetated roadsides in Nebraska. And so to kind of start off, we'll get some background of this project. And so Nebraska DOT, it was formerly Department of Roads, uh, they were started doing multi-species mixes in the 1980s. And so and when I say multi-species mixes, we're kind of saying five to eight species of grass, 10 to 15 species of forbs, um, but it really was kind of variable by region. 
um, we'll say region within the state, um, the Eastern, Western, that kind of thing. And I can get into a little bit more of that detail here in a second. Um, and typically in the Eastern side of the state, it would be tall grass, your common tall grass prairie species. And out West, it was more short grass to mixed grass prairie. So uh, that was kind of the idea that was being used at that time. Uh, but one thing that was done then that is not currently done is there was a mix of native species, but also introduced or exotic species used in those, those mixes. Um, some of the common introduced species, uh, some of them were pretty benign, things like alfalfa that, you know, we know establishes pretty well, but we don't worry about it being aggressive as far as invading adjacent range or, or prairie lands. Um, but then there's also things like Dame's Rocket, which we know can be pro very problematic in, in woodland margins, uh, especially on, on road verges where you have that open space. The Dame's Rocket seems to do very, very well in those areas. That's some stuff that we had in those mixes at that point. Uh, we no longer do, but uh, it was just kind of a, a big, bright breadth of different species that were being used because the main goal was to get vegetation on roadsides. Like that was the goal. We wanted diverse mixes that had good flowers, but also help the soil. And that was kind of the perspective. Um, over time in the you know, early to mid 2000s, staff changes, agency changes, uh, those, like I said, those exotic or introduced species weren't, weren't really even being used very much anymore. Uh, but, and so there was a shift to more, to almost exclusively native seed mixes, especially native fork mixes. And anybody that's made seen the, the cost of some of these mixes, it can get very, very high when you start adding 15, 20 different species of forbs or wildflowers. And so it it became, it kind of brought up this question, you know, we've been, you know, as an agency, DOT was doing it for this kind of more elaborate seeding mixtures for 20 to 25 years. And, you know, what was establishing? What was persisting? What how successful what was the agency at? producing the types of roadsides that they wanted. And, you know, it, it was kind of a question that nobody really had a great, you know, uh, understanding of. At times they, you know, like you could point to good sections where like, oh yeah, that's a great site. Uh, but then there's other ones that you're like, oh, not such a great site. You know, what was the site history and all that kind of stuff. And so it, it really brought to mind that DUT wanted to look at, you know, more seriously in, a, in, a, in an actual research setting like what is persisting? What did we seed? Is it still there? Is it establishing? You know, is it worth all this extra cost that we're putting into it? And, you know, are we going to have success 10, 15, 20 years down the road? And so um, what we decided to do, and so this project took place in, I believe the, the data collection years were 2008 and 2009. So it's a little bit of an older, older study, but I think it's certainly very useful information. So, uh, NDOT uh, worked with researchers from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, like I said, and uh, what we were planning to do is evaluate mature seedings that were approximately 10 to 15 years old. So that's, that's kind of our maturity date. So we're looking at things that were seeded in the mid-90s. So stuff that had had a ch chance to really kind of come in, stabilize, the perennial species are there, you know, everything that's kind of gone on in its history is, is in the past. Um, so what we were kind of doing is we selected sites on, on known projects, so there were known construction projects in that, that five-year period in the mid-90s that we knew that we had extensive grading and we knew we had a lot of, of revegetation work going on. So we, uh, we basically selected those specific types of projects. We got a list and then we went and checked and kind of verified in the field, okay, do we have what we expected um, on these sites? Because sometimes you can see from this area, this is a pretty wide back slope or, you know, right here, you can see where my cursor is, but sometimes in certain parts of Nebraska, the corn may start creeping a lot closer to the road. And so sometimes it just, the site wasn't indicative of what had happened in the past because of different changes. So we kind of wanted to avoid the areas that were not representative of the seeding at all. Uh, we wanted to avoid areas that were near residences or, or outbuildings because um, at least here in Nebraska, the closer you are to a residence or for those kind of structures, the more likely you are you're going to have um, a pretty extensive mowing operations by the, either the private landowner or the person farming those fields. Uh, that's something that happens here a lot is uh, a lot of additional mowing beyond what DOT does in and of themselves. And I guess we kind of looked at these sites as having, you know, 
a pretty typical management regime for any DOT project. So these weren't babysat plots that, you know, researchers like to come up with. You know, I've done a lot of this kind of plot work where you can do this and, and you control all these different variables. Well, these projects are not like this. They've had drought, they've had a good rain years, they've had all kinds of different things that I think are pretty standard for right away where you can't control all these different variables. It's just, it's the weather you get and it's what happens and you kind of move forward. So these are, I think this is a very real world scenario as far as how these seedings establish, how they persist or potentially not persist over time. To do that, we wanted to look at, we kind of had two sampling techniques. So modified step point and then biomass sampling. So biomass is just clipping vegetation, getting bulk biomass. Um, so for those not familiar with modified step point, it's kind of a unique, uh, it's common here on the prairie, uh, but basically what you do is you look down at the tip of this kind of cane looking thing, you walk through a, a, a sampling area and it gives you an idea of each time that thing hits the ground, you can get an idea of, of soil cover and then you can go in an arc about 180 degrees in front of that, that the very tip of that pin and then you identify the nearest species so you get a species assessment as well as a ground cover assessment so that's kind of the tool that we use we added the biomass in the second year because what we were seeing in the data and what we saw with our eyes were not lining up uh, and we'll, i'll talk about that here shortly but just kind of to go with some uh, a little bit more of the background of, of the project so these different regions are the main kind of eco regions that dot used so Within these, each of these colored regions, you had a seeding mixture that was fairly uniform, um, caveat being they were not exactly the same. Uh, there were, you know, some slight variations, and because maybe these two projects are really close together, but maybe this was 93 and this was 97, so the seed mix changed a little bit, um, or a certain species wasn't available one year, and so it got subbed out for something else, or a couple more were added. Those kinds of things just happened, especially when, you know, it's it, nobody was planning a research project on this. And so we kind of had what we had. And so trying to just understand, you know, what's commonly used in these areas. Um, but just to kind of give a little bit of background, I know we got people from all over the country and the continent, um, but kind of a quick rundown in Nebraska. This eastern third is kind of tall grass prairie. The middle is mixed grass prairie, sand hills prairie here in green. And then we kind of have short and mixed grass prairie out west. Um, I think an important thing to note, uh, a lot of the eastern third, eastern half of Nebraska has got a lot of extensive farming. And so there's a lot of, you know, on the landscape as a whole, we have a lot of, of ag fields. And so there's a lot of areas of disturbance. And you get, but when you get here in the central part of the state and out west, you have a lot more areas of native prairie, native rangeland. And so there's a, on a landscape scale, you have a more intact ecosystem that the road happens to just be going through. And so I think that'll be, that is an important thing to remember as we go and kind of talk about this a little bit better because it, it does have an impact on our project. But to get to some data, um, and I need to move these. So, sorry, there we go. Um, as you can see, kind of getting a little bit of data here. I'm going to try to not to spend too much time on this data, but give you guys a picture of what we're looking at. Um, so this is kind of the species richness. And I need to move this. There we go. So I can see it. The um, kind of just a general sort of thing. We're seeing 30, 40. Um, up here in Sand Hills areas, we had almost 80 different species on the sites. Uh, but when we start looking at what we seeded, so we had 27 seeded species, only 11 showed up here, 22, 13, you know, basically less than half or around half. Um, so it's, uh, it's not looking great sometimes. And really where we look at the grasses, the grasses aren't bad. You know, they're really pretty common. The, the seeded grasses that we're using, and that's both a mix of, of native species and some introduced grass species, they seem to be establishing well, and we're finding them 10 to 15 years later. The forbs, the wildflowers, if you will, not doing so great. You know, here in the Northeast, we seeded 18 different species. We, we detected three 15 years later, you know, and, and that kind of story pays out, plays out through all these different regions where the forbs, the wildflowers, they're just not there 10 to 15 years later. So 
if you're managing for you know a visually appealing roadside uh, this is not necessarily what we're what we're after you know we're spending a, like i said a fair amount of money on wildflower seed and after yeah this 10 to 15 year time frame it they're basically disappearing so uh but you have about five minutes left okay thank you um moving on to the next slide if it'll advance okay oh advance too fast so one technique that we wanted to look at was the flourish quality index and typically it's a comparative tool between restorations and relic sites or uh, maybe a, a newly acquired relic site and the, the reference relic site it's pretty common in the midwest and great plains um, basically what it does is it allows you to to assign this coefficient of conservatism uh, which is a number and that's for all species that you're going to find so annual weedy species that are native one something that's highly conservative like western prairie french orchid a federally endangered plant or threatened excuse me um, that is a 10 so that's really high but your common, at least in Nebraska, prairie species like big blue stem, it falls in the middle, that's a six. And then if you're non-native species, uh, they score a zero. So if you have a lot of non-native species, it's really gonna weight down your, your score. Looking at some of this data, you know, we're seeing for the biomass, and this is not just, it's kind of a, it's a calculated amount. And so the, basically the way to read this data is the higher the number, the better. And so in the biomass, like I was saying, because we talked about the step point, the richness was not really good, but we were seeing like some of these sites look better than this. And you can see in the biomass that, you know, you're getting some better FQI scores. You know, you're seeing, you know, 20s, upper teens, but then in the modified step point, you know, it's 10, I guess this one's 15 here. Uh, so it's, it's, you're kind of seeing these things separating out. Basically, some of it is because the biomass, the native species are so good at producing biomass in the Great Plains um, that they just tend to like over, you know, dominate the, the biomass. And with your eye, when you drive by at 65 miles an hour, that's what you see. So you can see a, a pretty grassy roadside, but with the step point, it's all the little stuff in between and a lot of like Kentucky bluegrass, that kind of stuff tends to kind of get washed out. So, going on I think one thing that we found that was really really interesting and I think is probably the most useful for one of the most useful things for folks is this comparison of cropland FQI versus rangeland so those sites that have cropland that are surrounded entirely by cropland versus rangeland the FQI scores on a whole were, were higher in those rangeland areas meaning that there are species coming in from the rangeland areas from the prairie areas populating our roadside and some of them have a relatively high score and it's shifting our site up higher than is anticipated and so and then the cropped areas are lower because again you've got a lot of disturbance on the landscape we've got a lot of other things coming in and tending to dominate our roadsides uh, so a little bit more data uh, so you can see this is seeded in volunteer forbs so you're seeing um here you've got you know these two sites this one this was Maximilian sunflower, and it's a big, tall, aggressive. Uh, it's a native forb species, but it tends to really dominate when it gets established. But um, here, like I was saying, in our rangeland areas out here in the sand hills and the panhandle, our, our volunteer species are, are much more common than what was seeded. And so it's almost like saying that the system, the, you would say the larger ecosystem, knows what plants it wants, and that's what's showing up here on our sites. And some of that may be. Uh, that we weren't planting the right thing at the time or whatever we need to be planting wasn't available in the mid 90s. So that's certainly possible and certainly a reasonable thing to assess. Um, I think that's kind of all I want to say on this one, given our time. Um, yeah, if you could wrap up, we have about a minute left. Thanks. Okay, yep. Um, so, and I guess really kind of going through this data, there's, we're just seeing that the grasses are really dominant not surprising. The forbs are there in times, but really not a ton. Um, but so like I said, kind of conclusions, uh, in general, the our seeded forb species really performed quite poorly um, in areas where we had done a lot of seeding. Um, like this one example photo here, this is in the sand hills. You've got a lot of species that are never in our mix, but they're here and they establish well. 
Um, so I think it's really a, kind of an important tool to think about or an idea to think about um, where the seed is most useful. You know, in our rangeland areas, we probably don't need to seed a lot of wildflowers because they come in from the landscape. In those cropland areas, that might be a more important place to put our seed money because that's where we can potentially have a better impact. Uh, kind of future research that developed outside from a result of this project um, was this idea of wildflower islands. So maybe a pulse of maybe a, a 50 by 50 foot dense planting of wildflowers on like, like a whole hillside of a, of a road cut just to um, give a big punch of wildflowers rather than spreading it across the whole landscape. And then kind of another idea of that is, and that's on like newly graded sites um, from, and then the next kind of phase of that research is doing that wildflower island interceding into currently vegetated areas. With the idea being, can we boost up our existing uh, vegetated sites and provide better quality habitat without having to like totally regrade the whole thing? Because like a lot of people, you know, we're really cognizant of what the future uh, of the listings of like the monarch and some of the other pollinator species that could really be impactful on our rights away. And so trying to find a way to get really good habitat without, you know, really having to do a lot of extensive work to, to rehab these sites. Um, so with that, I'm kind of running out of time. Um, I appreciate everybody's time on this. This is published if people would like to see it. And I can send you a, uh, a copy of the paper if you'd like it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, if you'll have any questions, you can put it in the chat and um, the speaker can maybe answer your questions in the chat. But we're going to head off to our uh, our last speaker, Theo Wetzel. Again, he's going to talk about plant and pollinator biodiversity in the TVA right of on the Cumberland Plateau. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity today. Yeah, I'm going to talk about some work that uh, our organization, the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative, has been doing in Tennessee and Alabama over the last four years. This was originally gonna be a three-year study, but COVID destroyed one year of our uh, field time. Uh, so we are wrapping up this year, three years of field work. I'd like to start any kind of discussion of grasslands in the East with an acknowledgement of the myth of the squirrel and the damage that it's been done. And what that is, is if, if you're like me, um, raised in the, in the Eastern United States, you probably heard from elementary school on this myth of the squirrel, the story that the forests of the Eastern US were so dense that a squirrel could travel from the Atlantic seaboard to the Mississippi River without ever touching the ground, uh, which is certainly still being, is actually in textbooks uh, for elementary school kids still today. And of course is incorrect. There were extensive areas of large uh, tracts of forest uh, historically in the East and still are today, but it was not uh, solid. And mixed in with that was a lot of grassland. And in fact, we're just beginning to really get our heads around how much grassland we had historically. Of course, um, Euro-American settlement began on the Eastern seaboard and moved uh, westward across the United States very early in our history as a nation. And we lost our, our, a lot of the grassland habitats were the first things to go and be altered uh, and changed uh, by a variety of factors, which is kind of beyond the scope of this talk. But um, this is sort of a, an evolving map that, that we put together uh, along with some colleagues at NatureServe uh, and other places that, that sort of hints at, not, not to say that this was all grassland that we're showing in green, but these areas in green had a significant grassland component or had significant grassland patch communities uh, within them. And uh, that was a major part of our biodiversity and a lot of the imperiled biodiversity today is sort of this grassland uh, component of the overall picture. Uh, and you really have to go back, not just into the scientific record, but into the historical record to really get a sense of how much grassland uh, there was historically. This is a really cool French map of uh, sort of the, the, the southeastern uh, part of the country from 1720. And it's showing uh, these extensive areas that they've mapped as savanna or savanna lands, good pasture ground. Uh, and when we sort of think of that savanna landscape, these sort of grasslands with scattered trees, but with the diversity uh, and the biomass uh, really concentrated in that herbaceous ground flora layer, we really kind of began to understand how extensive this was. Um, 
And then to give you some eco-regional context, uh, I know a lot of people are from, from all over the country here, but the Cumberland Plateau ecoregion is uh, this area here. It really starts in Kentucky and, and moves south through uh, a band across sort of east central Tennessee and into northeastern Alabama. It actually includes a little bit of Georgia. Uh, and it's sort of this high flat tableland. Um, this is this is a good example, and it's it's deeply dissected in places by rivers that have cut through as the landscape was uplifted in the past. Uh, but but typically it is a plateau, so you have this sort of large plain like flat landscape uh, that's cut very much in different different regions. Cool, uh, elevation relief model there that sort of shows what that's like. And the photo there is taken at a place called Savage Gulf. Uh, it's in Tennessee where that uh, red star is. And you can just sort of see that flat tableland. The, the geology here is uh, a sand, fixed sandstone cap uh, to the plateau surface. So it's an acidic uh, upland area above the sandstone cap. And then the uh, slopes of these gorges and the escarpments on the sides of the plateau are underlain primarily by limestone. Uh, and, and those areas are very different ge geologically. And historically, they're very different, and still today, very different uh, natural communities. Today, we typically see on the surface of the plateau, which is where this discussion is going to uh, focus, a dense. You know, and this is in areas that haven't been cleared for, you know, cleared off for pasture or converted to cropland or whatever. But the, the sort of wooded portions of the landscape, very dense, uh, mostly hardwood, some pine, uh, but very dense forest and very low diversity. Uh, and really in the canopy as well. And part of that reason is historically these areas were supported extensive open savannas, uh, kind of like what you see in this picture here. This is a, uh, a savanna today in Oklahoma, shortleaf pine savanna, shortleaf pine post oak savanna, which is what likely was a major component of this Cumberland Plateau surface system. Um, and these are some quotes from the Cumberland Plateau of Tennessee. Uh, there were areas that were completely treeless two, three hundred years ago, uh, vast upland prairie covered with a most luxuriant growth of native grasses pastured over as far as the eye could see with numerous herds of deer, elk and buffalo gambling in playful security over these secluded plains. Uh, just uh, 225 years ago uh, in, in the Cumberland Plateau of Tennessee. Also, this other quote uh, from the 1870s about uh, tracks similar to the oak openings of the West, where the trees stand wide apart or in graceful groups of broad vistas opening up on every hand, some of which extend far into the distance. Here and there, little sunny glades or miniature prairies appear in the distance like cultivated fields. And these are mostly gone today. The only, um, there's a few examples of recent restorations where land managers have gone in and sort of found areas that had remnant flora uh, hanging on and rights of way or edges of areas and thinned the closed forest out and reintroduced prescribed fire uh, and, and sort of gotten back some incredibly interesting and diverse uh, savanna landscapes like this one at the Patusa Wildlife Management in uh, Cumberland County, Tennessee. And we know that these were grasslands historically from a number of lines of, of evidence, uh, not the least of which uh, there's all, all sorts of historical evidence, but the presence of what we call grassland conservative species, things that are obligates to grassland ecosystems present in these areas. Things like the red cockaded woodpecker, which uh, was historically present and is unfortunately now gone from Tennessee. And uh, this rare plant here is a Schwalbia americana, American chaff seed, obligate grassland plant, fire dependent, uh, that was known from the Cumberland Plateau historically, but is no longer found there today. And there is this concept that most of this was a forested landscape and certainly some of it was and is today. This is an old growth forest on the Cumberland Plateau at a place called Fall Creek Falls State Park, but it's down in the gorge. Those areas are where true forest ecosystems are, where the native uh, flora is shade tolerant, uh, the rare and conservative species are forest obligate species. Uh, these are seven species that are tracked by the Tennessee Heritage Program, sort of the rare species of the Cumberland Plateau forests. Uh, and they are found in those river gorges. They are not up on the plateau surface uh, as a rule. Um, uh, in contrast, there's a vast diversity of rare uh, grassland dependent uh, species. Most of the rare species of the Cumberland Plateau 
occur in about three or four grassland natural communities that are very much impacted in, in a fraction of their former uh, self. There are the, the calcareous glades and barrens of the plateau escarpment. There are these of the um, sort of dry upland sandstone savanna communities of the natural uh, plateau surface. And then there's a series of open herbaceous seepage bogs. Now today, um, and just for example, those seepage bogs have over 40 species tracked by the Tennessee Natural Heritage Program as species of concern of plants in, uh, in, in Tennessee. And those areas are um, where many of the occurrences of these species are today are confined to areas like rights of way. And this has been known to botanists for, for years, decades. Uh, somebody wanted to go out looking for cool plants nothing better than a big power line right of way that still has this sort of grassland component of that ecosystem present between these typically two walls of dark closed canopy forest with uh, leaf litter and, and very little uh, in the term, you know, very little uh, in terms of forbs and grasses on the ground. Uh, so we were really interested when the Tennessee Valley Authority came to us uh, four or five years ago and asked if we would uh, participate in a study looking at quantifying the value of these big rights of way, uh, rare plants, grassland flora, and also uh, insects, pollinators, and other insects that depend on these areas. Um, these are just some examples of rare species. So we worked with the Electric Power Research Institute and Tennessee Valley Authority and uh, came up with a study design where we have a series of paired plots. Uh, we have half the plots in these uh, rights of way on the gently rolling to flat surface of the plateau and the other uh, series nearby off right of way in closed canopy forests. Uh, and these are, and, and those plots are paired, they're on the same, um, they're controlled for variables like soil, uh, aspect, slope, um, you know, they're trying to make it as, as, uh, as fair a comparison as possible. They are concentrated in public land units. We had to cite especially the forest uh, plots in areas that we knew weren't going to be clear cut or managed in some way during the study. And of course for access, it was easy. So we have a series of, there's 30 plots. So there's 15 uh, sites, each with uh, this pair of plots. These are the plot layouts. And really there's two sets of plots within the same uh, larger, uh, they have the same center point. One is a uh, floristic plot set, which is here on the left. Uh, it's scaled to fit within the right of way with a 20 foot setback on either end to sort of minimize uh, shading of the adjacent uh, forest. And, uh, and then within each one is nine are nine uh, subplots. There's like this big macro plot, this sort of square, and then there's these, these nine circular uh, subplots within. And then within that is, a, is an inset plot. Uh, and these are what they look like on the ground. So these are their major transmission rights of way. They vary in size, but some of the biggest ones are a couple hundred meters for their, their large area. And um, the team here has their own protocol that involves uh, sampling. They have a, a bee the target uh, group for the study. They're sampling with bee bowls or pan traps, and then also doing sweep netting. Uh, they do a Berlazi litter trap. Uh, round, and then they have a set of malaise traps. And we have photo points as part of the program. These are at the- You have corners. about five minutes left. Okay, great. They're um, at the edges of these, these corners looking in towards the center. So this is a paired plot of uh, photo points. You can see the sort of the grassland component and then that uh, sort of low diversity, uh, I would say former savanna uh, in this case, that's, that's now a, and uh, these are just like some snapshots. We are not analyzing all the data until the end of the project. So uh, these are sort of one year deals, but, but typically we're seeing a, a two to one uh, plant species richness uh, average between the grassland plots and the forest plots. We can break that down woody and non-woody. And we see uh, quite, quite a difference there about um, among the herbaceous non-woody plants, about 5.3 to one ratio and then about one to one on the woodies. So the woodies are present in both, but of course the shrubs and the rights of way. The big take home, the big thing that we found, and this was totally expected, was this abundance of rare grassland plants, uh, many of which are tracked by the natural heritage programs in these states, but others that are just 
indicators of high quality, uh, sort of those high coefficient of conservatism species, like the previous uh, speaker was talking about, uh, were commonly found in these rights of way. This is just a few examples. These aren't even tracked by heritage, but are, uh, are kind of conservative grassland indicators that you were finding. Now these, uh, this set, we found 19 species of state conservation concern and several of global concern within these rights of ways. These are uh, some that are tracked by the Tennessee Heritage Program in the drier upland communities within the rights of way. And then we also had some embedded glades. These are rock outcrop grasslands and they have their own set of some really rare species, including these two desert succulents. This is uh, Minge's rock pink and uh, small stone crop. Uh, both of these were found only in sort of around the rock outcrops embedded within the grassland. And uh, a whole bunch of rare species associated with the wet uh, groundwater seepage fed uh, wetlands that we found within the rights of way, including some big ecoregional records, three carnivorous species, which is pretty neat, uh, these two sundews and the zigzag bladderwort, and uh, some really rare orchids that we were finding within the rights of way. This is the rose begonia, which had not been seen in the Cumberland Plateau in several decades. Uh, we found that in one of, the, in one of our plots and uh, the crested fringe orchid. And the rarest thing of all, we found some massive populations of the federally threatened white fringeless orchid, which was pretty fantastic. Uh, and then there's some good insect finds as well. They're still analyzing and identifying a lot of the, the bee species that they found. But these are some that were found in 2021. There was a rare ant that was new to the Cumberland Plateau or maybe had one other site. Uh, the post oak grasshopper and the amazing lichen grasshopper, which is a late species, well camouflaged against lichen. Just a few highlights of those. And they found major uh, discrepancies between bee abundance and bee diversity between uh, the rights of way and the uh, adjacent forested plots. 16 to one ratio of almost 14 to one uh, in uh, the number of bees. And uh, these are some 2021, just quick plots of, of raw data, but um, again, quite a bit more, uh, both species diversity of bees and also abundance in the open areas. So, you know, we're just trying to quantify what we think is pretty obvious, but it's useful to have that those rigorous studies done of those. And this is another really rare species that they found uh, in one of the plots, the lineage skipper, which is tracked by the Tennessee Heritage Program. And that's pretty much a quick overview of, we're going to hopefully be publishing this uh, sometime late next year uh, to be determined where we'll, we'll get it published. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge TVA and EPRI for the funding and all of the people who help with field work and site uh, Thank you so much, Theo. Can you guys hear me? Am I off mute? You are off mute right now. I can hear you. You weren't. Okay. I couldn't Great. hear you a little <laughs> bit ago. Thank you, Toby. Um, so really, I want to thank all the speakers for taking the time to join us today. Really wonderful presentations and some really exciting uh, plants and pollinators that are being found on um, utility rights of way as long as along roadsides. So we're going to move into the kind of the second part of our uh, webinar today, and that's our breakout sessions. We're going to have about 20 minutes um, of discussion uh, for our breakout sessions, and then we're going to come back together and hopefully be able to get a really quick overcap um, from the discussions that occurred in each of those breakout groups. I'm going to ask each of the discussion leads to give a 30 to 60 second recap um, of what they heard um, as some of the key themes. So uh, let's start with group one. Hey, I got the unmute there. Um, yeah, so we had a good group discussion. Uh, some people aren't doing monitoring yet for uh, plants or biodiversity. Others are just starting. Um, others have partnerships with their natural kind of uh, heritage data uh, managers. So, you know, state conservation agencies or universities. Um, so that was interesting to see kind of that spectrum and, you know, plants being a, a large portion of that. 
And that data is being used for a variety of purposes, right? Some just kind of getting information gains on sort of where, you know, especially rare plants are present. So they can use that for, uh, you know, planning and, and avoidance, uh, but also in cases to sort of target like where's conservation priorities for pollinator corridors or other efforts, as well as also where there's sort of degraded areas that can be uh, enhanced through restoration. So um, as far as like future research needs, there was, um, some discussion there, you know, a lot about we face barriers both from inside the organizations uh, in terms of like changing cultures and habits and perceptions, but also them with the public that our lands are around. And so um, research that can help inform uh, sort of the perception as well as sort of the adding to the business value as well as sort of um, conveying, um, you know, what, what risks can be mitigated through, uh, through biodiversity are all needed. Great, thanks, Dan. Group two, anything to add to what Dan just said? Yes, we'll add a couple things here. Um, it, it, uh, I guess the the consensus was that a not a, not a lot of people have a whole lot really focusing on biodiversity. Some some organizations are are way out there; others aren't that far out. Um, but there certainly is a need for it. And, and that it could be tied into some sustainability metrics. Um, we, we talked about uh, sustainability groups at, at, at organizations that may be a, a big ally for you to help bolster your program and, and get it recognized. Um, we, we also saw that there, there needs to be a value of our habitat. So there's no fear of creating habitat for protected species. You know, so what's that value so that we, we aren't out there just doing something knowing that we don't want to bring in this protected species um, because there's going to be other handcuffs or hurdles with it. And, and with that, it goes to the fact that, that maybe we need to educate the regulators more so that they truly understand what the biodiverse aspect of these right-of-way corridors is and that it's a positive instead of putting so many hurdles on us out there. Um, and there, there was a lot of talk about invasives and how to get ahead of, you know, some of the invasive curves that are coming on out there as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Lou. Group three. Jim, do you want to lead off? Jim, I think you're muted. Yes, yeah, sorry, I was. Um, our general discussion followed about the same as those, and um, nobody or not many are really focusing on doing intensive right away diversity monitoring, limited monitoring on certain habitats, such as grasslands and things. But everybody, you know, maybe related to new construction to, to determine things that need uh, you know, for compliance issues and things like that. Um, for additional research, you know, just effective ways to Get more effective ways for habitat establishment. And I mentioned one study we had in, in Georgia, we're looking for ways to remotely identify uh, sites that already had good diversity. So, cause those would be much easier to manage, and much less expensive. And uh, that was limited to a certain area of the Piedmont. So you know, some additional work in other areas, including the Cumberland Plateau and places like that would be beneficial. And, and also just to add one thing to that um, um, was brought up about more research on looking at how rights away could help with connectivity of habitat and facilitate the movement of organisms, especially migratory taxa, uh, kind of like wildlife crossings, but also in, including, you know, insects and, and other uh, organisms that aren't always thought of when it comes to migration. Okay, great. Thank you, Jim and Jarrett. Uh, group four. John, do you want to start out? Yeah, I can start. So for ours, kind of the general consensus for what people were doing for biodiversity, uh, a lot of folks kind of felt like they were doing more in the threatened and endangered species kind of realm, you know, looking for those species. That was kind of the extent. Um, there's kind of the beginnings of some people doing it for like the Monarch CCA and some of that kind of stuff. But um, I think a lot of people felt like there's there's just a lot of 
it's a lot of work right now to, to try to get caught up on that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, it's, I think it, there's a level of effort that is people are kind of seeing what it's going to take. And there, there's reasonable concern in that, you know, given uh, demands and everything like that. But yeah, it seemed like if we can kind of pair it with other things, that would be the best idea. But yeah, for the most part, it's, it's still in the teeny or 404 permitting kind of realm as far as what we're doing for, for uh, initial biodiversity monitoring. Steve, anything you'd add? No, I mean, he captured pretty well. Um, you know, we're in, in the process of developing that rapid, rapid assessment tool. But again, it gets into resources, who does it, where do we do it, how do we track it, monitor it, things like that. But I think beefing up our 404, 401 program when we're out there getting boots on the ground, that would be an opportunity to kind of build on that. OK, great. Um, I think we're up to group five. Um, yeah, I'll start. Uh, it was interesting. We actually had a couple of different organizations, both from utility, DOT, botanical garden, other organizations, and, and most of them had started monitoring biodiversity, some just in the begin beginning stages. So, you know, how are they going to use that information? Um, we'll see what's to come. Um, and then um, as far as, you know, barriers, you know, it was interesting, you know, about uh, the seed costs and getting enough funding but also once the research was there, effectively communicating it so that the vegetation management wouldn't ruin the plots or mow down the plots or how you get that effective communication, you know, with the managers and with the actual people, you know, boots on the ground, um, being able to effectively do the research for a long term. Um, but, you know, a lot of good things, a lot of people um, had a lot of ideas and we put them on the jam board so everyone can see them for later. Excellent. And Theo, if you'd like to add anything, yeah. Okay. Um, how about we do group six? The oh, there was muted. Sorry. Yeah, oh, okay. just real quick. Um, we one thing that sort of came up was the need for just basic research to go or basic survey work to go and see what's in these rights of way. I kind of neglected to mention it, but we found over forty occurrences of state species of concern and these rights of ways under that we did in Tennessee and Alabama that, that the heritage programs didn't know existed. So they were new records. And I think a lot of these places, no one's ever looked. And so we really just need some basic qualified people to go out and do basic survey work to see what's there. And we may find that some things we think are rare are not so rare. We'll also find new occurrences of legitimately rare things that need to be managed for. Okay, thanks Theo. Um, group six, and I, I know we're at time, so if you want to just briefly um, add anything else maybe that hasn't been mentioned yet. Sure. Um, so we, I think most organizations in our group were not actively doing monitoring at the moment, but there was an interest in connecting with researchers, um, universities, or other organizations who might be doing the research um, on these topics. And then kind of along the lines in terms of the same barriers that folks have been talking about with limited staff capacity, um, getting internal acceptance and buy-in from leadership and management, um, understanding that this kind of work habitat um, improvement and protection is a long game, you know, something that takes a long time. It's not going to be something that happens immediately and getting management to understand that. Um, and then also there was interest in um, researching or finding regional best management practices for achieving habitat quality and protecting rare species. So more practical, you know, best management practices for protecting these species. Um, in various regions. Okay. And Casey, feel free to jump in if I missed miss something. I think you nailed it on the head. Okay, great. Um, and then lastly, group seven, any last thoughts? Okay, yeah, we, we don't have anything that's terribly unique to add after the six other groups uh, came along, but uh, we, we were mostly uh, either DOTs or utilities uh, and, and forest service. And uh, generally speaking, uh, monitoring for biodiversity is not uh, part of the routine, um, you know, data collection that that um, that these outfits undertake. Uh, I think there seems to be an interest uh, in in that. I think on on the part of everybody that was that was participating today. Um, 
but uh, many of the, the DOTs around the country do use um, a variety of, of wildflower seed mixes um, to benefit pollinators. And so there's a limited amount of monitoring on the, uh, the you know, the species um, that, that are part of those seed mixes. Um, so it's, it's kind of tangential to the real question there. Um, and then future research needs, we, we really sort of gravitated more to discussion about uh, what someone just mentioned was just, you know, what, you know, what kind of survey needs we really do have to, to, to take inventory of, of what biodiversity really is out there, uh, you know, pro and con uh, with, with invasives as, as, as opposed to natives. Um, we, we, we did bring in um, the idea of, uh, of the growing number of solar arrays that we're seeing in the landscape now as well. And um, so those are the less traditional, you know, linear right away settings. But um, so, so uh, interest in, in uh, maybe thinking about altering, customizing mowing schedules and how best to, to manage the contractors who do those uh, mowing, mowing schedules because they, they tend to want to do things on their own schedule as opposed to what's best for the the plant mix out there yeah. so uh so anyway yeah and sorry we're i know we're running short on time so oh caroline did an awesome job of organizing our uh jam board so okay thanks to her. excellent <laughs> excellent thanks thank you richard um and thank you all uh for great recap um as has been mentioned we are going to compile all of the jam boards and we'll share those out um, after the webinar as well as the recording to today's webinar um, so stay tuned for that um, we'll also be sending out a short survey. Um, we did try a shorter discussion period this time compared to last year. So we're interested in your feedback and if it was too short, just right. Um, and we'll, that will help inform our next webinar, um, which, oops, sorry, uh, will be coming up in November. Uh, we're still working to nail down the date, um, but as has been mentioned a couple times, another hot topic of interest and discussion in the research arena is that long-term management of pollinator habitat on energy and transportation lands. Um, and so we are in the process of lining up our research speakers um, for that webinar. Um, if you have any relevant research or interest um, and have any ideas to share with us, please let us know. Um, otherwise, stay tuned and we'll be sending out more information about that research roundtable um, once that information is available. So again, uh, thank you all for joining and sticking to the better end. Uh, some great discussion here and, and look forward to hearing from you and following up. Have a great afternoon.